Good morning, everybody, and thank you for this opportunity to present our work, which we are doing in Bhubaneswar. Uh, today, I'll be talking about uh, biogenesis and remodeling of membrane in biological system. I would cover today remodeling of membrane and their importance in biological processes. And tomorrow I'll be talking about membrane biogenesis and uh, how it is regulated. So if we see cell structure in eukaryotes, there are various organelles. And those structures are in different shapes. So they're not the, all the structures which are enclosed by membrane system, which is, so this is typical eukaryotic cell. Plant will have the organelles which is shown in this side, and animal cell in this side, and some organelles which are common. And this, there are nucleus, mitochondria, then ER, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, and then in plant chloroplast. So all are membrane-bound structures. The cytoplasm, which is present both in eukaryote and prokaryote. The membrane is not flat surface. They give different shapes like philopodia during locomotion. And then there are different structure in nucleus, which is they form nuclear pore, and you need different curvature. So you need remodeling of the membrane. And then mitochondria, which has double membrane structure, again, which gives very a large structure from inner membrane, which gives the Christie structure. So if you take different membrane organelles and membrane structure, they are not similar flat structure, which is uh, we understand by membrane. So there are many curvature, which is reinforced by various proteins and by lipid compositions. So if we see how we can change the membrane, so all needs membrane curvature change. How you can change the membrane curvature is shown here. You can simply start with a flat membrane and change the lipid composition with head group as we know that lipid in membrane has head group which is hydrophilic because it is made up of phospholipids, so which will have phosphate group which will give negative charge, and then acyl group which is hydrophobic, and they form bilayer structure. If this head group and this diameter and this diameter of hydrophobic group is same, then it will form parallel structure, and that will give flat surface. But there are lipids where head group is larger than the hydrophobic core, and if you introduce that, then you will form a curvature in one of the bilayer. So you can either make positive curvature if outer layer has uh, more head group, larger head group, and negative curvature if inner layer has larger head group. There are also proteins which actually brings about curvature simply by interacting with the membrane. And the protein structure, which is actually curved, will make the membrane, underlying membrane to take the shape of that protein. It could be either by peripheral interaction, or some proteins can get inserted inside the membrane, and it can change the curvature of the membrane. You can see there are various structures which can be achieved by different proteins, like amphipathy helix, which is present in both inside the membrane and exposed to the surrounding media, and this will make a king, and that will produce curvature. It can also be done by scaffolding protein, which could be either indirect. So this protein, which is a curved protein, can be attached to the membrane by another protein, and it can make the 
curvature similar to this protein, or it could be direct interaction with the lipid on the membrane, and it can actually give the shape of protein. Also, there are actin, which can push the membrane and give the shape, or microtubule, which can stabilize the shape like this. And of course, there are proteins which oligomerizes and makes curvature, and also some protein which shape is different can also induce curvature. This is the uh, same, it's in a different way it's uh, depicted here. So the proteins which are involved in membrane remodeling, it starts from, uh, there are various proteins like bar domain protein and then synaptotagmin. One of the large group of proteins which are involved in membrane remodeling is dynamin. So dynamins are actually as large GTPases, which was first discovered in the process of endocytosis where the vesicle is pinched off from the plasma membrane that needs curvature change. And th there are many members subsequently found in this family, the, uh, the classical dynamin being the founding member, which has five domain structure, and other dynamins which are not exactly having five domains, but three domains common to all the other dynamin, which is G domain, GTPS domain, and then middle domain, and GTPS effector domain. Classical dynamin has two extra domain, pH domain and PAT. pH associates with membrane, PRD associates with other membrane. So this large group of proteins play diverse roles in different organelles, in different organisms, to bring about membrane remodeling required for maintaining their shape and also to perform their function. If I show the first classical dynamin, what it does, actually, it associates with membrane. In endocytosis, dynamin dimers associate in a helical collar at the neck of the clathrin coated pits. Upon GTP hydrolysis, dynamin undergoes a conformational change leading to torsion and constriction of the helix. Fission happens at the edge of the dynamin coat where membrane stress is the largest. The protein components disassemble to be recycled. So if we see, in the neck of the vesicle formation on the plasma membrane during endocytosis, dynamin self-assembles into large structure. This is EM, and this is the structure which forms a self-assembled structure, and GTP hydrolysis leads to constriction of the underlying membrane. If the diameter is large, it will make smaller diameter and bring, ultimately, by GTP hydrolysis and conformational change, will bring two membranes together, and thus now sufficient to diffuse lipid between two membranes and mix, making fusing of this and this, and that will make a pinching of a vesicle from the plasma membrane. So dynamin family proteins associates with target membrane, changes the curvature, and can lead to either fission, and if we see, there are even processes which does exactly opposite. Instead of membrane fission, it can do membrane fusion, where, like in mitochondria, there are two different kinds of dynamin, which does membrane fusion of outer membrane and inner membrane. So one of the dynamin family proteins associates with membrane and tethers between two different mitochondria. This is one and this is another mitochondria and induces curvature change in the membrane and which is required for fusing these two membrane. And then it makes one mitochondria from two. And then subsequently, in our membrane, also there is another group of dynamin which will do the same thing as outer membrane. As we know, mitochondria is not static structure which uh, is undergoing constantly fission. That means it breaks and again it fuses. And that dynamics of fission and fusion is very important for cell survival. If fission is more, it will undergo apoptosis. And if it is 
Fusion is more, that means elongated, may lead to cancer. So this dynamics of fission and fusion of mitochondria is very important, and that is regulated by dynamin family proteins. So there is another dynamin in, for mitochondria, which is called DRP1, which will actually do function similar to endocytic dynamin, which will actually associate with mitochondria in the middle, and that ring will constrict due to GTPase activity, and that, similar to endocytosis, it will bring two membrane closer and closer, and then it will fuse, and then once you fuse this membrane, it will make two mitochondria. So the fission is done by one group of dynamin and two different dynamins for fusion. So this is the, how actually uh, fusion and fusion can make that uh, mixing of lipid into different membranes, where the two membranes has to come close enough so that that repulsion between two membranes due to that negative charge in phosphate group in two membranes is overcome by conformational change of the protein. And then there is water molecule which is removed due to this uh, conformational change which gives the force. And then two membranes when it's come close, there is diffusion of lipid between these two membranes and that leads to either fission or fusion. So dynamins have diversified role and Two of them already we have discussed is during endocytosis, where it forms the clathrin coated vesicles, and dynamin pinches off from the neck of the vesicle. Mitochondrial fission, where it makes a ring, and constriction of ring makes fission of mitochondria. Also, mitochondrial fusion, where two juxtaposition of mitochondria, there is change in curvature in the fusion place region, and then two dynamin, one of them for outer membrane, MGM1 in yeast, will bring them together and fuse, and another dynamin will bring inner membrane fusion. It also is involved in perixosome fission, chloroplast fission, which are different, but comes under same group of protein. Also, there are dynamins which neither makes the membrane fission or fusion, rather it makes a tubulation of dynamin, sorry, the, the vesicle. So if we take Golgi vesicles, which is spherical, what dynamin does, it associates with this, and if it takes the helical spiral shape, which is shown here, so this was a spherical vesicle derived from Golgi, and this helical spiral makes it dumbbell shape. So it's tubulation, tubulate. It doesn't uh, uh, make it break or fuse. And this dumbbell tubulation by dynamin is very important for cell plate formation in plant. So although we see the different functions of dynamin, like membrane fission, membrane fusion, or membrane tub tubulation, the underlying mechanisms are very similar. All the three processes involve membrane deformation. That means they have to change the membrane curvature, deform some way, and that's the underlying mechanism. So dynamin can be considered as a membrane deforming agent. However, there are another group of dynamin called MX in mammals, which has non-canonical function. That can be, cannot be explained by membrane deformation function. This kind of dynamin MX associates with viral nucleoprotein and inhibits its replication, including HIV and influenza. So mammals have used this as a defense molecule by restricting its replication. And this structure and function is very similar. It associates with the nucleocapsid protein and makes the similar structure, although it doesn't deform the membrane. So it, there could be dynamin which has role other than membrane remodeling. But most of the dynamins are involved in membrane remodeling. 
although there are roles in various organelles, role in nucleus for dynamino is not known. So, nucleus, as we know, it's a very complex structure. It has two membrane, outer membrane, which is continuous with endoplasmic reticulum, inner membrane, which associates with chromosome and lamin structure, and then there is nuclear pore, which allows communication between cytoplasm and nucleus to exchange factors. So you need different remodeling, curvature, and also when cell undergoes cell cycle, the nuclear envelope in higher animal, they completely disappears, it breaks down and reforms. So there is a membrane remodeling, which is required. But organism like yeast, it doesn't, uh, it's undergoes closed mitosis. Nuclear membrane remain intact, which is shown here. So th this is in metazoan, where nuclear membrane, which is shown here, is broken at the end of prophase, and it completely disappears, and again re reappears at the end of allophase. So it breaks down and again forms. So there is huge nuclear membrane remodeling during cell cycle. But there is another organism, like closed mitosis, as for example, yeast, the nuclear membrane remains intact, so it needs expansion, it has to expand. So it, the expansion of nucleus will require incorporation of lipid as well as proteins which are in the nuclear envelope into already existing membrane. And this mechanism of nuclear expansion, how it happens, how it incorporates lipid and uh, protein into already existing membrane is not known in our, any organism. So we use tetrahymena, which is a single cell ciliate, and it has two nuclei, one small germline nucleus, which is phenotypically inert, it doesn't express any gene, and one large macronucleus, which is derived from that small germline nuclear, but there is tremendous amount of new, um, uh, gene or chromosome breakage and removal of some DNA sequences, and it makes fragmented chromosome almost 200. It, it, the germline contains five chromosome, deployed is 10, so n is equal to five, whereas this large macronucleus will have 45 copies of each chromosome fragment, which is 200 to 250 because, uh, uh, copies because of breakage and uh, of each chromosome. So it will have 10,000 copies of chromosome fragments, and that's why telomerase, which was discovered in tetrahymena, because each time you break chromosome, you need to make telomeres at the end for chromosome stability, and that's why telomerase is highly expressed in tetrahymena. Now, why we use tetrahymena for addressing nuclear expansion? Because tetrahymena, like yeast, it also undergoes closed mitosis, so it will require membrane expansion every generation to fold. More importantly, tetrahymena undergoes conjugation, where two opposite mating type comes together and forms a conjugating pair, and this gives signal for the germline nucleus, which is phenotypically inert, to undergo meiosis, which gives four meiotic product. Out of four meiotic product, three goes back and gets degraded. So one haploid in each partner divides mitotically, so it will be haploid, two of them, identical, and they get exchanged between partners, fuses to form zygotic nucleus, which is very similar to higher animal like us. There are nuclear, haploid nucleus from two different partners and coming and forming zygotic nucleus, and this will be identical since it comes half from this and half from this. So there is genome mixing, and after this, this zygotic nucleus divides two times mitotically to give four identical germline nuclei. The old macronucleus, which has undergone a tremendous amount of uh, breakage and lost lots of DNA, it subsequently degenerates, it goes away. And out of these four, in each partner, two will be selected and will expand 10 to 15 fold, it's a huge expansion, 
to give new macronucleus. That means that which is the large nucleus. And that will be giving the phenotype. And that, this expansion is huge. And that's why Detriminov provides as a very good model system to study mechanism of nuclear expansion. There is no cytoplasmic factor known which governs this stage. We discovered the first factor and we found it's a dynamin protein which is required for transition from this stage to this stage. So tetramina, although it's a single cell ciliate, it has very complex membrane structure, as complex as human. And you can see tetramina has eight dynamin related proteins, which is very large. Uh, considering a single cell organism. Out of these, two of them has endocytic role. One is shown by genetic analysis that it is uh, endocytic dynamin. DRP2, which also associates with endocytosis. DRP7 and 8, localization mitochondria. However, DRP3 to 6, these four dynamins in tetramina, they don't have any homologue in other organisms. Looks like it's a lineage specific clade. So it might have lineage specific role. One of these four, DRP6, when you GFP tag, it goes to nucleus. So when you GFP tag and express this DRP6, it goes to nuclear envelope, as well as some cytoplasmic functor. Before that, only nuclear dynamic known was in human, MXB. And MXB, it associates with nuclear envelope, particularly with nuclear pore, and it regulates nucleocytoplasmic transport. As you know, there is nuclear pore, and then there is communication between cytoplasm and nucleus, and that is regulated by nuclear pore. And MXB somehow associates with nuclear pore and regulates this process. So we thought this could be another example of MXP homolog, which is not present in any other lineage except human. Towards this end, we we tried to see whether DRP6 also plays a role in nucleocytoplasmic transport. We have shown there are two compartments: one nuclear envelope and another puncta. We didn't know what is the identity of the puncta, so we did a marker which is actually endoplasmic reticulum marker, which GFP tagged and expressed, and we see the cytoplasmic functors are actually endoplasmic vesicle, which is itself is a novel compartment, which is not known in many organisms except plant, but their function is not known even in plant. So those are very novel compartment, which is ER derived and vesicles. So we showed that it is present in two different ER compartments, because we know nucleus is ER compartment and also ER Vesicles. To address whether it associates with nuclear pore, we expressed one of the NAP, which is part of nuclear pore complex, and then co-expressed HA tag DRP6 so that we can stain with HA antibody. And then we, when we did the co-localization, it doesn't exactly localize with each other. It's if we see carefully, it's actually outside the nuclear pore. So it also, to see whether it actually regulates the nucleocytoplasmic transport, we deleted that gene, removed that gene by knockout, and assessed their function in nuclear transport, where we made a GFP construct with nuclear localizing signal, which will enrich inside the nucleus. This is only GFP because it's uh, 40 kilo delta and it can pass, but it will not end it so much if there is no signal, so it can be used for nucleocytoplasmic transport as soon as we add NLS. Now, if we delete this gene DRP6 or use some dominant negative allele to suppress the function of internal DRP6, either way, it didn't inhibit the nucleocytoplasmic transport. So that shows that unlike human MXP, DRP6 doesn't play any role in nucleocytoplasmic transport. At least it's not essential. So that was the question now, what DRP6 does in nuclear envelope. So for that, we 
started with expression analysis and localization. And when we check the expression, it actually expression is highest in a stage where mic is actually has formed new macronucleus, that is nuclear expansion stage. And also, if we see the localization, early conjugation, it falls off from the nuclear envelope and becomes cytoplasmic puncta and remains so till it comes to that stage. So this expression, as well as this localization, strongly suggests a role during this stage. That means formation of new macronucleus. To see whether it actually affects this stage, we made knockout of TRP6 in two different mating type, and we conjugate them with and compared with wild type, wild type conjugation. That eight hour stage which forms this, wild type, you can see all the pairs, almost all the pairs forms nice new macronucleus. These are new. This is old, which will degenerate. When we knock out, this stage is inhibited. We further confirmed by expressing dominant negative allele, which will inhibit the internal copy function, and we get very drastic inhibition in this stage. This shows that DRP6 has evolved a novel function in nuclear remodeling, that is during macronuclear expansion stage. And we have also shown that it's not due to inhibition in earlier stages, because if you inhibit any one of the stage, you might inhibit this stage. So we have shown that it is not due to earlier stage inhibition. So that is specifically during this stage. We have also shown its role in nuclear expansion in vegetative cells, where it undergoes uh, like binary fission kind of uh, growth, which is asexual mode of reproduction. Now, DRP6 associates, so we, although we have shown it's involved in nuclear remodeling, nuclear um, MAC development, but we don't know the mechanism by which actually this protein brings about nuclear expansion. So to do that, we started structure function analysis of this protein. And as you know, this protein associates with nuclear envelope as well as ER vesicles. So to see whether it has a lipid binding domain, because unlike classical dynamic, which has a pH domain, there was no pH domain in DRP6. So what we did, we made different construct, different parts of protein we expressed in bacteria and purified and did one lipid overlay assay and we saw that full length it associates there are 15 different lipids which is uh, that strip was bought from commercially three of them interact phosphatidic acid phosphatidyl serine and cardiolipin and if we take only 517 to 600 that gives exactly those three one two three lipids that means this part is sufficient for giving wild type interaction. So that could be a lipid binding domain. Once establishing that it has a lipid binding domain, we checked whether this lipid binding domain is required for nuclear recruitment because it goes to nuclear. Or of course, we just model this protein based on classical dynamin and we showed that this lipid binding domain is exactly located in the place where pH domain is there. And this is important because the mechanism of function is very similar, so the other domain is, should be with respect to membrane binding in similar position to give the similar structure. Another dynamin, MXA, they have also shown, they also don't have pH domain, but it locates exactly in the same region. And that is understandable, they have different sequence, and that sequence difference is required for identifying different membranes. So once we have shown this lipid binding domain, we either deleted the lipid binding domain from the protein or we expressed only the lipid binding domain. So if you delete lipid binding domain, it no longer goes to nuclear envelope. That shows that it is required for nuclear recruitment. However, only that domain is not going to nuclear envelope. That means it requires other domains. So I, only this part doesn't go. Even if you delete this, this doesn't go. That means the Domains other than these also required for nuclear recruitment. And we have taken different parts and showed that they also don't go until unless there are other domains, both N and C terminal. 
we have. Now we know that lipid binding is important for nuclear recruitment. However, we don't know that mechanism by which DRP6 associated with nuclear envelope. So what is that in the nuclear envelope which brings that DRP6? For that, we used a mutant. Uh, this was a very serendipitous result. When we are cloning DRP6, and one of the clone we got, which when we expressed, surprisingly, we didn't see nuclear localization. So we thought something wrong. We, have, we might have uh, cloned some wrong gene. So we sequenced the gene, and we found entirely the same sequence as the DRP6, except one residue, which is I553 in the membrane binding domain. So that is required for nuclear membrane recruitment. And now we have used this mutant because it has only one mutation to see what is the property which is different from wild type to see the mechanism of nuclear recruitment. So we know that dynamic proteins, all the dynamic proteins, they associate with membrane, assembles, it has GTPase activity, and disassembly. So to see whether DRP6, it's a GTPase, so whether it has also GTPase activity, so we expressed both wild type and mutant I553 in bacteria, purified, and did a GTPase assay, and we didn't see significant difference in GTPase activity. So this nuclear recruitment, loss of rec nuclear recruitment may not be due to GTPase activity, defect. It also self-assembles, so we did self-assembly by gel filtration. Both has similar properties, so it's not due to overall effect on self-assembly. Also, we have checked the, the, form, the dynamic family proteins forms helical spirals and ring-like structure. We checked negative stained purified protein under EM, and we checked that PRP6 also forms those structure ring structure, helical spirals, and also mutant also could form the similar structure. That means it's not due to defect in GTPase activity, not due to disassembly defect or structural defect. What we could see, since DRP6 binds membrane, we did an in vitro membrane binding assay by making lip liposome. What we do, we make liposome either containing cardiolipin, or phosphatidylserine. As you will remember that uh, it associates with phosphatidylserine, cardiolipin, and phosphatidic acid. So we tested two, and then incubate with either wild type protein or mutant protein, and do a flotation assay, which is very regularly used, where we incubate protein and liposome, and then put on the tube at the bottom, and layer with different percentage of sucrose, and if you give a high speed spin, liposome will float. So if protein will not float because it's high density, it will remain there. So if protein interacts with the membrane, that means liposome, it will co-float with liposome. That's the basis. And that's what we checked that, yeah, if we keep only protein, it cannot float because, of course, it has high density sucrose, so that's good. And if we take liposome, it co floats with liposome, this protein. Now we use two different liposome, either cardiolipin or phosphatidylserine. Wild type can associate with in vitro membrane, either containing cardiolipin or phosphatidylserine. However, this mutant I553M, it associates with associates with phosphatidylserine containing membrane, but not cardiolipin. So that defect, which that mutant, single mutant, it lost the interaction with cardiolipin due to overall loss of membrane binding because it can bind membrane which has phosphatidylserine. So it's very specific interaction, cardiolipin and DRP6, which is lost due to one mutation that is in I553. Cardiolipin is a lipid which has uh, three glycerol backbone and uh, it has, instead of two acyl group, it will have four acyl group. So the structure will be, head group will be smaller and there will be four acyl chain. So it will give negative curvature. 
So it's, it's uh, present mainly in uh, mitochondria to give that Christie formation and re So once we showed that it is due to loss of cardiolipin interaction, which may have caused that loss of nuclear recruitment of this DRP6, we now checked whether DRP6, if we reduce the cardiolipin inside the cell, whether DRP6 will fall off from the nucleus. And that's what we did. There is a chemical called pentachlorophenol, which is used in bacteria when it is uh, treated with PCP. It inhibits cardiolipin synthesis and degrades cardiolipin and within five to 10 minutes. And so there will be very low cardiolipin, which we did for tetraimina. This is very nicely when no treatment, nicely nuclear envelope associated. As soon as we treat, starts with 5-10 minutes, they completely falls off from nuclear envelope. So cardiolipin actually, which is reduced, is making DRP6 fall off. That means this interaction is important. Now, one may argue that this may not be specific to cardiolipin interaction rather than the membrane structure is compromised, nuclear membrane. So how do you show that nuclear membrane remains intact? So we took nuclear pore complex marker, which shows very nice envelope, nuclear envelope, and it remains intact. That shows that nuclear, that nuclear envelope is not compromised. That, that is another nuclear envelope protein, and that doesn't fall off. It's very nicely decorated. So that means it's not due to overall change in membrane structure or membrane organization. Rather, it's interaction between cardiolipin, which is present in tetraimina nucleus, and DRP6, which is important for nuclear recruitment. We have also shown by another membrane marker that other markers are also, other membranes are not also compromised. So now, what we know is that DRP6, which is a dynamin protein, is recruited to nuclear envelope by cardiolipin interaction through lipid binding domain. And this is important for nuclear expansion, which is shown here. When we again inhibit or reduce cardiolipin at this stage, this stage is inhibited. So this is without treatment, and with treatment, this macronucleus development, which is here, very light color, this is new MAC. This is not developing. That means inhibiting cardiolipin, you can actually inhibit remote or nuclear expansion. And this could be due to DRP6 interaction. We also used another dye, NaO, which is known to bind cardiolipin in vivo. And also it, people have used for inhibiting uh, cardiolipin binding protein in mitochondria. And that also inhibits nuclear expansion this stage. So that shows that cardiolipin interaction is important for macronuclear develop development. And we have also shown that the DRP6 is important for macronuclear development. So there is very similarity. Also, to directly show that DRP6 interaction is important for nuclear uh, development, macronuclear de development, we have also inhibited expressing some part of this membrane binding domain, which will inhibit this process and should be specifically inhibiting the DRP6 interaction, and with that inhibits MAC development, and that's what it does. Either we express membrane binding domain, it inhibits MAC development. This is wild type, wild type. This is inhibited. Or if we delete membrane binding domain, that also inhibits. So that shows that DRP6 interaction at this stage is important for nuclear development, MAC development, that expansion. And we again show that it is not due to inhibition in earlier stages. So what we have shown, that DRP6 interaction with cardiolipin on the nuclear envelope via membrane binding domain is important for nuclear recruitment and macronuclear expansion. Now, how actually it regulates macronuclear expansion, we still don't know. So it did a live cell imaging, how it can do. This is GFP-TAC DRP6, it's our protein, which is associated with 
cytoplasmic puncta, which is ER vesicles, and also this is a dividing cell. So it is making two cells, so two nuclei. And it's closed mitosis, so nuclear envelope remains intact. It expands. And you can see this ER vesicles, which are present in cytoplasm, in many places they come and associate with nuclear envelope. There are many of them. Yeah, one. This will be very prominent in, in a second. So there is vesicle vesicle fusion. So that means it's either carrying something, it's transporting something, and then also it is carried to nuclear envelope from cytoplasmic puncta. So this is a uh, dividing nucleus, so it will expand. Nuclear envelope will expand, expand, and I think this. One of them will be very clear. There are many of them, such event. Okay, yeah, this one will come very soon. This is cytoplasmic puncta, which is ear vesicles, which has membrane. And that would come. So this part is trying to expand. So it will require some things. And we think it's membrane, which is required, and it becomes part of this membrane. So we think that the ear vesicle membrane is giving the membrane, which is required for nuclear envelope expansion. So it now, how these vesicles are carried? As we know, in cell, vesicles are carried by microtubule. And you need motor protein, either kinesin or dynein. So this is retrograde transport, that means minus end. So minus end is towards nucleus. So it should be carried by dynein and on the microtubule. To see that, if you see the next slide, that's what the vesicle, and this is one of the motor protein which walks through the microtubule and carries either plus end or minus end depending on whether kinesin or dynein. Dynein will take to the minus end and uh, kinesin will take to plus end. So to see whether our vesicles which are cytoplasmic and comes to nucleus, whether they are also associated with microtubule and is carried by one of the motor protein, we express this protein and as GFP tagged and inhibited protein synthesis and kept longer, and we could see that this protein can now show distribution on a microtubular arrangement. So that gave a clue that it may associate with microtubule. And what we did, we actually expressed as tap tag in tetraimina, purified by two tags so that it will be highly pure, and then analyzed by mass spec to see what are the proteins comes out, and we see it that it interacts with tubulin as well as one of the many dynamins. There are many dynamins, but only one dynamin it interacts with. Actually, two. Uh, one is uh, minus end, another was plus end. So this uh, minus end will be more appropriate for this test. So now, after seeing that, whether this actually localizes inside the cell, they are together. So we use two different antibodies, which is monoclonal antibody raised in mouse, and then DRP6 antibody. And we see there are significant amount of co-localization. That means inside the cell, they are actually part of same complex. They can associate. We have also overexpressed our protein GFP tag, and then use tubulin antibody. We see now those tubulin very nicely co-localizes with DRP6, and also they enrich the or stabilizes microtubule on the nuclear envelope, and wherever there is GRP6, there, wherever there is association, there is microtubule is more. As you can see, if it is less GRP6, less microtubule, whereas more, there's more. So there is a correlation. So that means it's stabilizing somehow. And that mutant which doesn't go to nuclear envelope, it still associates with microtubule. So it, is, it again shows that it is not due to microtubule association defect, rather it's cardiolipin interaction again, it shows. So this, what we did now, whether this interaction is important for carrying and macronuclear development, because this vesicle will be carried, and if it is required for nuclear expansion, if we inhibit either microtubule structure or inhibit dynein function, it should inhibit the process. And first we did treatment with nocotazole, which will destabilize microtubule, and ciliobrevin, which will inhibit dynein, both inhibited recruitment to nuclear envelope, which is, we thought it is expected, because it is carried by microtubule, and also 
it inhibited that stage, macronuclear development stage, either treatment with nocodazole or ciliobrevin. It inhibits that expansion stage. So it shows that the vesicle which is present in uh, cytoplasm and DRP6 carries that over the microtubule. So it's like if it is microtubule, this is nucleus where DRP6 is sitting and there is vesicle which has DRP6 by dynein, somehow it interacts with dynein and microtubule and takes them here and this DRP6 interacts with this DRP6 and maybe they are fusing the membrane which will be required for small nucleus to become large nucleus because you need more and more membrane or other material. Now if that is the case, DRP6 should be able to remodel the membrane. That's what we did in vitro. We made liposome, which is very spherical structure, shown here. And we either incubate with cardiolipin containing liposome with DRP6 or phosphatidylserine. So two different kinds of liposome. As you can see, DRP6 can tubulate and make branches of this liposome. Phosphatidylserine containing liposome also gets remodeled, but this is more branch and more tubular than phosphatidylserine. So that actually is different because uh, um, TRP6 has different functions. Cardiolipin it doesn't interact when there is mutant, but it still interacts with phosphatidylserine. So there may be some difference in curvature change, but there is definitely a curvature change and remodeling of membrane by TRP6 in vitro. Whether that has any um, role in vivo, whether it regulates that nuclear remodeling of nuclear envelope. So we took the wild type tetramina, which is negative stain, and nicely you can see double membrane structure. This is outer membrane, inner membrane, and this will be nuclear pore structure. And when we did that with either knockout or dominant negative allele, this nice parallel structure, double membrane structure, now it is distorted and becomes clear. So this shows that DRP6 is required for maintaining this structure of nuclear envelope. As soon as you distort, that means it has nuclear envelope remodeling function, and that might be required for nuclear uh, membrane fusion and expansion. Okay. So what we have, we have DRP6, which is present in vesicle, ER vesicles, and also in nuclear envelope, and it is required for this expansion stage, which is 10, 10 to 15 fold, which will require other materials, including fresh lipid incorporation. So we propose that these vesicles will be carried by microtubule, and homotypic interaction between DRP6 here and here will bring them together, changing the membrane curvature, and lead to fusion, and that brings the nuclear expansion. And this process is not specific to tetramina, this nuclear expansion. So what we have done here is we have actually discovered a new way to expand nucleus. The nuclear expansion by vesicular population, which gives the membrane and maybe other materials for expansion, is not known in any organism. So we have added that this ER vesicles goes from ER to Golgi, Golgi to uh, lysosome, vacuole, plasma membrane, and there are transport across the secretory pathway, but there is no vesicular transport from ER to nucleus so far. It's known. So we have shown that there is another transport pathway from ER to nucleus, which is required for nuclear expansion. And that these vesicles will be sitting there. If you it should be sitting on cytoplasmic puncta. If you go to localization side. Yeah. So it fell up from nucleus and it remains a cytoplasmic puncta. And this it, this conjugation happens in starvation. So during starvation, there will be not much new synthesis. 
So when you need nuclear expansion, you need new membrane synthesis. And these punctiles which are sitting will be the source of membrane. So when there is expansion, these punctiles will go and give the membrane, and that will give the nuclear expansion. So recently, uh, not very recent, 2015, there was a paper in developmental cell. They have done in microfluidics, they incubated mammalian nucleus with Xenopus oocyte extract, which is used for nuclear membrane uh, formation as well as expansion. And when they do, they see that increasing the microtubule, it increases the rate of expansion, it you need Microtubule more and also they don't know what is the fraction. They know that one vesicular fraction from oocyte is also important for this expansion. So this vesicular fraction, which needs vesicles, but they don't know identity of vesicles. What is the role of this vesicle? So they show that these vesicles, which we know are derived vesicles, will be carried by microtubule and make more air sheet around the nucleus, and that is important for expansion. So it's not specific for tetraimena, which you have seen. Looks like it's a very general mechanism in all eukaryotes, where there is a different route for expanding nucleus, where vesicles are very important, and microtubule carries them to nucleus. Yeah. Oh, this protein, actually, uh, dynamin can do both fission and fusion. So there are a group of dynamins which does fusion, they don't do fission, like mitochondrial um, fusion dynamic. And fission dynamin is different. So there, there, there may be different uh, regulation, like uh, GTP activity, membrane composition, and also other factors. So uh, surprisingly, we have also seen something different, which I have not shown here. here it is. So see, generally, when dynamin is incubated with membrane, that means when they associate with membrane, there is hundredfold increase in GT phase activity. And that GT phase activity is important for conformational change and breaking the membrane, membrane fission. Surprisingly, we don't see any, when we incubate with um, liposome, cardiolipin content liposome, it doesn't increase the GT phase activity. In fact, it reduces. So what we think, in fusion, actually, you need to stabilize those carved structure so that they get enough time to protein brings them together and get time for fusion. So this is fusion dynamin may have some property which is very different from fission dynamin. So we know that it's one of them has actually this is uh, oh, specifically for cardiolipin containing membrane but not phosphatidylserine containing membrane. So it's very specifically inhibits GT phase activity and that's why it strengthens our a model that it is actually membrane fusion, which may be important for this function. I think uh, what we presented, I presented today is uh, all different PhD students work to uh, students, Usha and Himani. Tomorrow I'll be presenting about biogenesis and how the membrane biogenesis is regulated in tetrahymena. And that will present tomorrow. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any. Any questions? Do these uh, effects on varying the curvature of the membrane yeah. in themselves lead to any changes in uh, the pattern of further development or differentiation? With changing the curvature by any means? Yes, in other words, does the mechanical forces, uh, do the mechanical forces that are involved in changing membrane curvature have any other effects? Okay, so of course there will be a force which will be required to bend the membrane. Uh, there is no study showing that whether the bending by other mechanism would serve the purpose, those processes, because it may not be only bending, but there will be some other factors also which are required for bringing that particular process. So there are many other factors which also associate with during endocytosis, and that is important also. So only bending may not be sufficient. There will be other uh, direct factors which will be required. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
but may, uh, of course bending is one of the very important process. I have a small question. So is there any way to predict or think of how much curvature you need in order to get this kind of effect? Because so in, I mean in, it's, it's oh. basically is it like very small changes as you increase curvature or is it like step function kind of a thing? Okay, so this, at least in the endocyte, which is, uh, it's been shown recently, the when two membranes, it forms neck, like uh, this is plasma membrane, bilayer, then there is invagination by clathrin. This will be bilayer. This is bilayer, right? And that forms vesicle. So clathrin will make this shape, that is coat protein. And then dynamin will recognize this curvature and then associate with it. And they undergoes hydrolysis. As soon as they associate with membrane, there is huge hydro, means GTP hydrolysis activity, 100 fold increase. So during that, it will give conformational change. And this conformational change will make inner diameter of dynamin that helical spiral small. So underlying membrane will be squeezed. And now it's shown it comes within that three nanometer. So three nanometer is important to freely diffuse lipid. And it's been shown that two membranes comes within three nanometer. And then now once you bring that, so you have overcome electrostatic repulsion due to this phospholipid, phosphate, and also you have removed the water, and now this hydrophobic lipid can actually diffuse between two membranes, and then it can. This is, uh, itself is a fusion, right, between two membranes, which leads to fission of uh, vesicle. So, so can I continue this question? So with the dynamin recruitment, right, it recruits on the curved membrane. Yeah, it recognizes hey. curvature. But does the recruitment, so is there like a two-way communication so that as soon as you start getting curvature, you recruit dynamin, which will increase the curvature. Yeah, it further increases the curvature. So you have an amplifying kind of a reaction. Yeah. yeah. So initial curvature, which is given by coat protein, which is not sufficient, but that actually su uh, sufficient to give signal for dynamin recruitment. And once it recruits, it's actually further changes curvature because it will constrict. If you constrict, make more tubular, so it will change curvature. And that's what it will uh, add up to the already existing curvature. Any more questions? Okay. As there are no questions, let's thank our speaker again. And Let's go for lunch. <laughs>